When I was in sixth grade, I sat down to create this crazy new world. I had just read The Hobbit, and bursting with anticipation, I rushed home after school, threw my bag over the armchair, got out some white printer paper, and began brainstorming this new world I was going to devise. But what I didn't know at the time was that ten years later, following dozens of unfinished manuscripts, scrapped comic and art ideas, and massive amounts of revision, this world would still exist within the realms of my work, but as more of a backdrop to a much more developed story. To put it simply, over the last decade I had taken the foundations of what 6th grader me had come up with, and replaced it with a more mature narrative that fit the tastes of my early 20s. Now, I've done this with a lot of my stories. In fact, most of the stuff that I've written have come from other ideas that haven't quite panned out in the past. It's like my old ideas are just kind of a junkyard of decrepit cars, and every once in a while I'll find a brand new transmission or an unused tire with lots of life left or something else that I can salvage from a wreck and use it in my new car, this car being the equivalent of my new story. And so that's what we're here to talk about today, what makes good world building, and why you shouldn't quite give up on all of your old ideas just yet. So let's focus on the seeds of forging new worlds, the antidote to the monotony of everyday life starting with the seed itself. First, let's talk about the seed. Now, the seed, like that of a plant, is simply an idea that will grow and form into something that eventually stands on its own. But it needs attention, it needs care and maintenance. If neglected or overlooked, it can develop problems, cease to grow self-sufficient, and die. And that's the thing. This is the beginning of the foundations of world building. Take, for instance, the incredibly diverse and rich world of Avatar The Last Airbender, which began back in 2001 when Brian Konetsko pulled out a sketch of a balding middle-aged man and re-envisioned him as a child. From there, he shared his ideas with fellow showrunner Mike DiMartino, and together they began to forge the path to what would become, in my opinion, one of the greatest television series ever made. So even a simple idea, if given the right atmosphere to grow, can achieve something incredible. Once the seed is planted, it will grow. The next question being, what kind of world do you want this to be? And that, my friends, leads us to chapter two. Game of Thrones author George R. R. Martin famously had an interview in which he broke creative writers into two different categories, the architect and the gardener. The architect is more or less someone who has figured out what the story is going to be before they've even written it. In other words, they've planted the seed for world building long after they've answered all the questions about what it will grow into. Surprises may still linger under the surface, but chances are the architect knows how to deal with them. Their head has a blueprint that the story must follow. On the other hand, Martin attributes himself more to a gardener type. They take the seed and know what kind of seed, i.e. what genre, it'll be, but not much else. The gardener will inevitably build the world as it sprouts leaves and grows, and will likely find themselves creating ideas and lore when an opportunity arises. These two writer types may very well determine what kind of world building your story takes form in. And that, my friends, leads us to chapter 3. Now, I'm sure you've seen it before. Worlds with laws, 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 and more laws. Places that have indefinite lore stretching on for ages. There's a system of currency, different languages and races, well-established history and topography, developed colloquialisms, defined weather patterns, their own mathematical, scientific, and magic systems, and so on. And one of the golden textbook examples of this is none other than J.R.R. Tolkien, who created the spectacle of Middle-earth. Now, Middle-earth is so big, Tolkien easily has done more than half of the things I just mentioned. He outlined the history, provided famous figures and lore, created magic systems, religions, languages, and most of all, assembled an all-encompassing world that envelops the reader into its pages and doesn't let go for a good while. You can step into his book, Sir Peter Jackson's Films, and be truly immersed in the world, its lore, and its characters. You feel like you can reach out and touch it because of how well planned out it is, and as such can almost imagine it existing for real in another universe. This is the power of hard world building, a structure of storytelling with rigidity, liveliness, depth, detail, and most of all, complete immersion. 
But here's the thing, hard world building as great as it is can also be extremely restricting, almost as much as our own world. Let me explain. If Tolkien decides one day he is a character who's a hobbit from the Shire, I don't know, become a wizard? Well, then he's broken the rules of his own world and created a plot hole, because hobbits, according to Middle-earth rules that he wrote, cannot wield magic. Sure, they can use magical objects like the ring, but that's about it. He would have to write a very specific special exception in his Middle-earth laws to allow for it or alter the idea itself or move on. This is hard world building. The story exists to obey its rules unless the point of the story is to be the exception, such as Bilbo having an adventurer's calling or Gollum being mutated by the ring's influence from his once quaint life as a river folk. Even these examples, in my opinion, don't really break the rules. They just twist them to make things more interesting. And though fantasy has a bit more leeway when it comes to how much you can have exceptions in your world, Middle-earth stands as a rigid example of a vivid, well-developed atmosphere. In other words, if you want that sweet, willing suspension of disbelief, you probably shouldn't break your own world laws and introduce inconsistencies in the narrative that can't be easily excused. Because in hard worlds, there isn't much room for that, even for the authors themselves. And then there's scenes like... <laughs> which even in soft world building would be highly questionable. Here, it's positively silly. So hard world building has its advantages and disadvantages. Luckily, that's not the only type of framework to choose from. Enter soft world building. Remember that whole spiel about how authors aren't able to break their own rules without proper explanation? Well, soft world building exists to take those rules and essentially make them a little bit more flexible. Not everything needs an explanation here. Sometimes things just happen, and from the character's or narrator's point of view, the events will never be properly explained, and that's okay. There are things that happen in our world that are hard for humans to quantify. And so that idea of putting yourself in the shoes of someone in another world who doesn't understand why islands are floating in the sky and they can walk through portals stops being seen as a failure in lore explanation and instead seen as the viewer experiencing the world as the main character does, one thing at a time. And this is how soft world building achieves its own sense of immersion, through perspective. Take Harry Potter for instance. Rowling doesn't explain a lot of her thinking on why things work in this world even less in recent years, if you know what I mean. But just like you and I, Harry doesn't know jack about the wizarding world either at the beginning. Why can the Weasley's car fly? How does the time turner work? What about portals? How do those work? Did Peter Pettigrew really just chill for 12 years as a frickin' rat? Some of these questions are answered and others aren't, but I can't deny that a lot of the fun is simply in following Harry and his friends through their misadventures, as they learn new spells and the world begins to open up around them. Instead of walking into an already established Arbitorum, you get to watch the world grow around you like a garden as you read, one plant at a time. And so by the end you feel like you've grown with the characters and the world, and there is a nice sense of accomplishment with that. Soft world building can be wonderful and exciting, though it's necessary to mention that if too vague, it can start to feel flabby and uninspired or lazy, so it's important to keep enough details to enrich the world without digging yourself into a hole. Now in reality, there's no story that doesn't use both hard and soft world building in some ways. There will always be things that can't be explained and rules that everything must follow. So in the end, it's just down to what you want to do and what balance you desire to achieve. Do you want to grow your world as well-established and rigid, or are you willing to influence it as it comes and not explain everything all at once? These are not relegated to fantasy genres either. Plenty of great world building exists in places around our world across all genres and mediums. Animation, live action, music, video games, no matter what anyone tells you, these are all 100% legitimate and capable ways of creating intelligent, emotionally poignant, and impactful stories and worlds. Don't be afraid to borrow ideas and get inspired from other things around you too. Inspiration when applied to create new and original ideas is a great thing. But I'm getting ahead of myself. In most cases, hard and soft world building is not a decision you need to make right away, as the next point might help you to guide you in the right direction.
The motive. The so what who cares question is one of the most important things to establish in your work. If you're creating a world, it most likely has a story that it's servicing or an idea that it's built around. In Watership Down, it was rabbits journeying through dangers to find a new home, then trying to ensure their continual survival in that new home. In The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, it's Mikael Blomqvist and Lisbeth Salander trying to solve the cold case of a missing woman. Each are very different stories starring completely different characters and conflicts, but they have one thing in common. Each has a razor-focused reason for existing, and the world acts as a backdrop to that effect. One of the common things I see with some inexperienced writers is that they tend to go on and on about a world and a war and how the gods formed it and everything else. But when I ask them about who the main character is or what the actual plot of the book is, they often can't answer me. And yeah, I used to do this too. Someone would say, hey, what's your story about? And the first thing that would come out of my mouth would be, well, it's kind of hard to explain. And if your story is just complex and you're not sure how to wrap it up into a five minute conversation, I totally get it. It's hard, isn't it? I still struggle with condensing my stuff into casual conversations too. But if all you have is a world and no story, then it's essentially like having a garden with no plants growing in it. The soil is one thing, but the plants provide food and sustenance, just like a story does. So if you have a world without a story, it's best to leave the endless lore on hold for a bit and see what a world like this would be to live in. Create characters, create conflicts, and from there, create lore relevant to plot events. People's connection to your work will likely be through the characters and the specific things they go through. All that history and world building is important for context, but can't replace the central elements of your work. The reason most people are interested. The story. So now you have your world. You've decided on what kind of world it will be. You have characters and a story. So now you need to put it all together. At this point, the seed of your world has probably grown pretty self-sufficient. In other words, the characters have begun to have their own personalities and act in certain ways based on events around them. And this goes for your world too. Opportunities will arise where you might want to include elements of your world building to enhance your narrative. Though exactly when is it appropriate to do this? Well, let's take a couple of examples that I think do it pretty well. In Avatar The Last Airbender, the city of Ba Sing Se was mentioned previously in the series, but it's not until the middle of the show that we actually see and learn more about the city's lore and its people's oppression. Likewise, in The Witcher 3, the lore of both Skellige Isles and Kaer Morhen is revealed, but only as it becomes relevant to the story. Without the characters going there and experiencing the place in person, it would likely just be another piece of random lore about a place that you've never heard of, or a war that took place that doesn't really affect your current status in the story, so why should you care? But the lore is kept at a down low until it serves a direct purpose to the context of the characters. Geralt goes to Kaer Morhen with Ciri and meets the other Witchers. This opens up discussion about what's been going on in his absence and the history of the once mighty School of the Wolf. And that connection to Geralt makes it super interesting. The history feels alive instead of distant and non-relatable. So I guess what I'm saying is that when building your world, you'll want to carefully consider where to insert world building into your story. In my opinion, the best times are at the beginning, where you can establish the character's first open impressions of the world, and consistently throughout the middle, where times will come up and you'll want to explain things to the viewer. Info dumping, whether it be in dialogue or paragraphs, is rarely the best way to share information about your world. More often than not, show don't tell is the way to go when carrying across your hidden lore in an effortless, non-forceful, and meaningful way. I could make a whole video on show don't tell, but essentially it's subtle visual cues that allow the viewer to make inferences about things without being directly told what's going on or having the context rammed down their throats. In short, there are lots of great examples of Show Don't Tell, but one movie that does it really well, in my opinion, is the Japanese movie Drive My Car, which was released in late 2021. A lot of the movie is long cuts of the characters in silence, but if you want to know what their feelings are, it's always defined in their movements or their facial expressions. 
It gives the movie a very realistic angle and it's a great watch if you've got three hours to spare and kind of like sad but comforting down to earth stories. So a world with a story, show don't tell, lore, and characters. At this point you likely know whether your story will be hard or soft world building. Chances are if you started with a world that was pre-planned, had a story and characters already to inhabit it, it's hard world building. And if you started with a story and formed the world around it as you wrote it, then it's soft world building. Though this is a simplification and is certainly open to exception. And this is it, the plunge, that moment you get to look over your world and get to smile at what you've made. I think one of the greatest things about world building is its ability to provide a creative escapism from the daily responsibilities and stress of life. To leave the world of taxes and insurance policies and 401ks and all that BS is sometimes just bliss. Especially if you can imagine yourself in a place where none of that stuff matters. A place where you can make the rules, the conflicts, the people, the community, and most of all, build the world around you to perfection. The world that you want. But anyway, that's pretty much my ideas on the subject of world building. It's a lot of fun, and whether you're doing it alone or with others, it's really cool to sit down and get your dreams on paper. But what kind of stories do you love? What are your favorite genres, mediums, and types of stories? Are you writing a story yourself? But as always, if you liked this video, please consider subscribing for more like it, and I'll see you all next time. Happy world building!